welcome to our Food and Feelings Town Hall. Um, my name is Haley, and this is Emily. And before we introduce ourselves, we just wanted to give a brief rundown of what the town hall is going to look like. So maybe for some of you, you've done town halls before um, in this style. Today, we are going to be discussing all things food, feelings, eating disorders, body image. Um, and we'll do that for about 40 minutes. And then around 1.40, we are going to open it up for a Q&A. So as Emily and I are chatting, feel free to just start to leave your questions in the chat box. And at the end, we'll sort of just be scrolling through the questions and we'll have an opportunity to answer them the best that we can. Well said. So again, just welcome to people who are joining. It's good to have you all here. Um, my name is Haley O'Brien. I'm a psychotherapist and yoga teacher here in Washington, DC. Um, I have a practice in DuPont Circle and I specialize in the intersection of complex trauma and eating disorders. So that sort of brings us here today just to share with you a little bit about eating disorders. Um, I come from a long history of my own personal experience with an eating disorder, and that's exactly what motivated me to pursue the work professionally. Um, in addition to my own recovery, I got a lot of on the ground training in treatment centers. And that's exactly where I met my very good friend and colleague, Emily. Yeah, so to say a little bit about me, I'm, my name's Emily Arkin. I'm a registered dietitian, also based in Washington, D.C. Um, my practice has been in uh, Farragut Square, so just one metro south from Haley. And um, I, I should say that right now, it's just like everybody else, kind of 100% virtual for the time being, but usually that's where you find me. Um, I... Um, my nutrition education started uh, during my undergrad. I went to uh, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, um, and then I did my master's at Columbia and um, relocated to Washington, D.C. soon after that. And I have to say, I didn't know that I would be in the field of eating disorders. Um, it's something that is has a very tiny bit of required education within the field of nutrition and dietetics, but definitely is viewed as, you know, something to sort of specialize in after. And so a lot of people get their, um, their training or their experience from doing, you know, from either working in um, a treatment center or organized program, or maybe under a more senior clinician who has a lot of experience in the field. And so like Haley mentioned, um, she and I met while working at a treatment center that offered um, PHV and IOP levels of care. And so for those of you who might not be familiar with kind of like the eating disorder speak, um, I would sort of summarize that as like basically day programs and, and evening programs, um, you know, ones that have a little bit more support all throughout the day and ones that are, you know, folks just coming in in the evenings. Um, but yeah, so now, you know, I find myself specializing in eating disorders, um, but also working with gastrointestinal disorders, um, as well as just a health at every size approach to managing other conditions that benefit from nutrition intervention. So very excited to be here and um, yeah, we're, we're excited to talk to you. Yeah, just thinking about how, how much you learn when you're at a treatment center and just the nuances from the mental health and nutrition end, right? When it comes to working with eating disorders. And actually one of the things that Emily suggested is that we make this sort of a, a lunch and talk sort of deal. So each of us are coming in with our own lunch, which is we've got our food, um, which is actually really common in eating disorder treatment, right? That we sort of normalize eating together and we integrate it into the treatment. So um, yeah, and that was your brilliant idea, Emily. I'm wondering if you want to say more about that. Well, you want to tell us what you're eating and I'll share my plate? Oh yeah, so I've got a, a, a tuna fish sandwich and some leftover cherry tomatoes that um, if you shop at Costco, I'm sure you can recognize the tomato medley that I am trying to eat my way through. Mm -hmm. And this is my plug for chicken and whiskey located on 14th Street. 
that conveniently delivers from my home. Um, yeah, you know, to reiterate what Haley was saying, um, because we are clinicians who treat eating disorders, we want to normalize eating as part of daily life and, and make sure that we're modeling normal eating wherever it's possible. So given that this was scheduled around lunchtime and Haley and I haven't eaten yet, you know, we're making time to do it now rather than thinking of, you know, it's being kind of an either or situation, presentation or lunch, we're just going to do both. So mm -hmm. glad you guys are here along for the ride. Um, and I think, you know, something that Haley, I want to kind of pause and add in before we get too far into you know, some of the stuff that we had planned for today was to acknowledge that, you know, our sort of combined image might perpetuate some of the stereotypes about who gets eating disorders. Um, you know, media representation of eating disorders is heavily skewed. So, you know, if you find that you are not a young, thin, white, cisgender female, you know, you're not, you're not the odd one out by any means. You know, something that you'll hear a lot in this field is eating disorders do not discriminate. Yeah, and we just want to take a moment to acknowledge our own, our own privilege being in the bodies that, you know, we were born into. And, you know, unfortunately, the eating disorder field, along with um, overlooking a lot of diagnoses um, that our field is dominated by people that look just like Emily and I. Um, and so this is our, you know, acknowledgement of that and also our acknowledgement that our field needs to do better in getting the care to all people and designing treatment to fit the needs of all bodies. Um, so that's something that we definitely want to make space for weaving in and out of today's conversation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And at the end, we're going to provide our contact information. And so, you know, if you're someone who is looking for clinicians that have, you know, intersectional identities that more closely align with yours than what we could offer, um, we'll do, you know, what we can to connect you with, with any resources like that. Mm -hmm. So um, just stay tuned for the end and, and we'll share our email addresses. Mm -hmm. So to kind of kick things off, um, you know, I'm, I'm imagining that there are some viewers here that are maybe coming out of curiosity or concern for loved ones, or maybe folks who, um, you know, have sort of acknowledged that this is something that they struggle with, or maybe even people who are kind of wondering if it's really a, a problem for them. And so, Haley, I'm curious to ask you, you know, do you think it's important in our work to distinguish between eating disorders with a capital ED um, and disorder eating. Yeah, I think that's, um, you know, there's a big push certainly in our community to make that distinction um, within diagnoses, but my answer is sort of a yes and no. Yes, uh, very unfortunately for the reason of, of insurance, you know, there actually are di eating disorder diagnoses or even sub threshold eating disorder symptoms that aren't covered by insurance or not reimbursed properly um, for private pay. And so sort of like leaning to getting people more care, I can be pretty pro-diagnosis, you know, but the truth is, and Emily and I were talking about this just a couple weeks ago, that disordered eating, if it is causing a significant impact on your life, if it's causing a significant amount of stress, which it typically does, um, that's an issue that deserves treatment just as much as any formal diagnosis, right? Um, certainly on the medical end as well, and the nutritional end, we can see the same amount of impairment from disordered eating versus eating disorders. Um, yeah, what do you think? Yeah, I want to I want to reiterate what you just said. You know, if you feel distress around your relationship with food or your relationship with your body, that's really enough to seek help. Um, you know, having a formal diagnosis can sometimes hit home the severity or you know allow more access to insurance benefits, but that is not you know necessary to be taken seriously by a professional. Um, 
you know, there are clinical criteria that exist for the diagnosis of an eating disorder, but so many more things that are unmeasurable. Um, you know, Haley, I think maybe folks would be surprised to learn just how many things you can pick up on in the therapy room when somebody is, um, you know, pretty deep into disordered eating patterns. You want to share mm-hmm. those with us? Yeah. So whether it's an eating disorder or disordered eating, um, some of the stuff that you just aren't going to find in the DSM that you can pick up on in the room are things just like heightened anxiety, Should right? Should we pause and say what the DSM is? What was that? Should we pause Ooh, and say what the DSM is? Good idea. Yes. So the Diagnostic Statistic Manual of Mental Health Disorders, I've got it right next to me. Um, and, you know, it's all broken in. I reference it. It's one of those things they update every four to five, six years, you know, um, it has all the, the mental health diagnoses in them. And within that big purple book, we've got an, an eating disorder section that continues to get re- revised. You know, in the last edition, the DSM-5, we added binge eating disorder. And we also added a number of sub-threshold eating disorders, which just to kind of reiterate the point about sub-threshold eating disorders, disordered eating, you know, full-blown eating disorder, um, Emily and I have both worked with people in, in a number of these diagnoses that have had serious impairment, you know. The DSM might say, oh, you know, this is the level of severity, but from our personal experience, we have information, you know, contrary to that. So, um, yeah, within the DSM, how do we get started on that? Mm-hmm. So what are, what are the things that you notice in talk uh, therapy? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So things that aren't listed in the DSM, right? Um, certainly increased anxiety, right? Just a lot of increased anxiety around mealtime, uh, discussions around holidays that involve meals, discussions around food. Um, I, I hear as a therapist a lot of food talk, and that's always a sign that I know that something's going on. Because as a therapist, you know, we kind of work with food, but mostly we're working with the feelings, working with the mental health piece. And when I start working with a client that just wants to talk to me about food, I'm very well aware that, you know, something else is going on. Um, And so those are things that, you know, you'll just see in the room, um, that kind of constant obsession with food talk and and body talk for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and honestly, you know, in, in part because I work so closely with therapists like you, you know, that stuff that I notice as well in my sessions. And what I would add to that is, you know, even though I can make good use of uh, lab results or bone density scans or, you know, other things that are measurable, other things that I might pick up on um, would include, you know, like muscle loss or weakness, um, fatigue in my clients, gastrointestinal distress, um, increase in like frequency or severity of injuries, um, sleep disturbances can sometimes occur and, you know, the list goes on. So there's a lot that, you know, a physician might not catch and that doesn't downplay just the severity of what you might be experiencing. Right. Yeah, for sure. And it's, it's interesting, you know, because there are so many subtleties. So you may have read in the, in the diagnostic criteria, um, a, a list of symptoms, but what Emily and I are describing, it goes beyond that, you know, so um, you know, another thing that I wanted to bring up was just the amount of shame that typically we see with disordered eating, within diet culture, within eating disorders, right? So this is a, is a broad span. I, I, am, I would almost guarantee that everybody watching right now has experienced um, the effects of diet culture to one degree or another. And so the amount that somebody is feeling shameful for fueling their body, for um, eating what they want to eat, you know? we kind of live in a very disordered world, Our the, what we're taught about food and nutrition. Um, so it makes it really, really hard actually to know, like what is normal eating? What is healthy eating? What are these, what do these things even mean? Right, well, especially when I would make the argument that normal eating no longer means how the majority of people eat just because dieting and weight control influences are so pervasive in our food culture. So, you know, when we think about this question, what is normal eating? I'm going to admit that's going to be a nasty question. 
<laughs> oh yeah, it is. Emily, what 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 is normal eating? <laughs> yeah, I mean something that I'll I'll throw out there and you guys can Google it on your own is um Ellen Satter ha has a really beautiful definition of normal eating that's that borders on poetry. So feel free to look her up. It's um E L L Y N S A T T E R. Um but the way that I might describe it is that normal eating is eating often enough and adequately enough to thrive, not just to get by, because I see lots of clients doing that, um, but to actually thrive. And so that looks like, you know, a willingness to eat more than you usually would when you realize that you're underfed and, you know, a willingness to offer yourself compassion when you're feeling over full. But, you know, ultimately, it, it should take kind of the rumination and over analysis out of the eating experience. Yeah, I love that you use the word thrive, right? Because I, when I think of thrive, I think of uh, so many different domains of our life. And when it comes to what we're taught, um, it, it's almost that there, there's this huge emphasis on physical thriving versus, you know, how about emotional thriving? How about social thriving? You know, if you are constantly stuck in a, in a diet cycle, you may have noticed it's really hard to go out to eat with your friends. I mean, COVID aside, right? But that it's, it's hard to go out to eat with your friends. It's hard to enjoy a meal with your family. And so in that sense, where's the thriving? You know, mm -hmm. how worth it is it to compromise that part of your health? Yeah, I feel like I have to jump in here with an anecdote. You know, being a registered dietitian um, around January, every year, people that I meet, you know, at holiday parties or that sort of thing, really want to tell me about their diets. And <laughs> um, usually this is right after I built myself a big plate of food at whatever <laughs> stage. And, you know, most recently I'll just throw, that as, throw out as an example has been a lot of emphasis on Whole 30. And so people want to tell me like, oh, like, what do you think of this? I'm trying it, never got better, all this kind of stuff. And I, the, the way that I get through those moments <laughs> is to kind of sit back and ask like, oh, that's interesting. You know, it sounds like a lot of things to cut out. It sounds like that would make it really hard to, you know, eat out with friends. And usually I, I see people, you know, sort of take that in and say, yeah, you know what, it, it is, it is kind of tough, you know, sometimes I just skip happy hour altogether because it doesn't align with sort of these food rules. Um, and I, I think that's just interesting to point out, you know, the way that we're willing to put certain, certain things that are good for our mental health kind of on the chopping block in the service of um, being careful around food. Right. But, you know, I think this sort of takes us that idea. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to validate, like, it's, it's what we're taught. Like you and I have the, a privilege of being immersed in a culture that's trying to think differently about our bodies and about our health. Mm -hmm. And if you're not actively learning about these things, all you know is what you see on the TV, social media, what everybody else is doing. You know, everybody's doing Whole30, so you know, why not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, you know, to go kind of hand in hand with a you know, a question about what is normal eating, it's worth talking about, you know, what is healthy eating? And I'm sure there are a lot of folks that are on today that are like, yes, what is it? I'm leaning in, give me the answer. Tell us what um, it is, please. <laughs> and th the first thing that I want to point out about it is that I, I think healthy eating is something that we think of as very fixed and it looks a particular way, but it's really not. You know, healthy eating is dependent on your individual needs, and it should honor both your physical and your psychological health. So, you know, in in today's society, you know, we tend to put a lot of focus on what we think is good for our physical health, mm -hmm. but that might also neglect things like abundance or uh, pleasure or flexibility or social connection. You know, these things that are crucial to our well-being. And so, you know, when we think about those aspects that we should also be valuing, it becomes clear how, you know, something like dieting doesn't really support psychological health. Mm -hmm. And I'll have a lot of research to back that up. 
yeah, if you're ever, if you're needing any, any additional resource, <laughs> resources, we'll, um, and research, we'll, you'll get our contact at the end of this. Emily's got a, a wealth of <laughs> data and knowledge. I just picture like all the bra <laughs> all the tabs that you've got open for your research on this stuff. I usually have seven <laughs> tabs open simultaneously. I can yes. never update my computer between closing too many things. Well, I think about like my, my journey and my own recovery, you know, that started many, many years ago before I decided to pursue eating disorders professionally, but something that I really struggled with, and I, I, I know that a lot of my clients struggle with too, is, um, you, you know, you, you, you try to cure your eating disorder or your disordered eating through dieting pretty much. And you get stuck in this cycle of failing and failing and failing. And so the question always was like, if it's not dieting, then how am I gonna get better? You know, how am I gonna heal my relationship with food if it's not through what all of these sources are telling me I'm supposed to be able to do? And as somebody with an eating disorder, I couldn't ever do it. And I thought it was because I had an eating disorder. I learned much later that, you know, diets fail for everybody and, and nobody can really do them. Um, mm -hmm. so a question for you, Emily is like, cause I'm sure people are wondering, well, if we're not supposed to be doing whole 30, then, then what are we supposed to be doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I think something that I, I want to say just to bring like a statistic in to kind of back up your lived experience is, you know, we see pretty overwhelmingly in the research that something between, you know, 95 and 98% of diets fail. And, and what I mean when I say that is that there is no study that exists that shows a significant amount, amount of weight loss. So like, um, you know, something that researchers would consider clinically significant, significant amount of weight loss, the majority of people in the study um, for a long-term basis, you know, beyond two years, that does not exist. Um, and so, you know, when you hear the sort of like diets don't work, that is where we're coming from. There are always going to be unicorns, <laughs> um, but most of us are not unicorns. And it goes back to thriving, right? You know, are these unicorns really majestic, thriving unicorns? I, right. I would guess not. Hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's a great question. If not dieting, then what? And all I can say is that, you know, I personally work with my clients to move towards intuitive eating and intuitive eating is a phrase that's become a little bit buzzworthy in the last few years. Um, so maybe people tuning in have heard of it, but I'll say a little bit more, more about it. It's a framework for building a healthy relationship with food that was originally put forth in the nineties by um, two dietitians, Evelyn Triboli and Elise Resch. And it's been very well studied at this point in has been shown to produce improvements in both physical and mental health parameters. Um, and so it's, it's different from diets in that, you know, the focus is not on controlling body weight or shape. Um, it's not even on sort of eat this, not that. Um, it is meant to be a way of bringing more attunement and pleasure to your eating experience. So, I mean, we, we could do a whole conference on intuitive eating as one topic, but to give you kind of a, a drive-by summary, I'll, I'll use the definition that's been used for research purposes. It's sort of three parts. Um, an intuitive eater gives themselves unconditional permission to eat. So just a mere fact that they are a living and breathing human being necessitates the need to eat. An intuitive eater notices their body cues and generally eats when they're hungry and generally stops when they're comfortably full. And an intuitive eater, oh, I got ahead of myself with my fingers. No <laughs> <laughs> permission to eat, eating when you're hungry, stop when you're full. And, you know, an intuitive eater, eater, excuse me, generally uses things other than food to cope with their emotions. And I, I want to bring your attention just to the fact that I really leaned into generally, because again, these are not rules that mean you pass or fail intuitive eating. We're talking about sort of overall patterns and things mm. to kind of be working towards, you know, understanding your own body cues a little bit better. Um, and so, you know, especially with that last one, using things other than food to cope with emotions, this is not to villainize emotional eating because 
that's very much a part of the human experience. And, and Bailey, maybe you can say more about that. Yeah, you know, it's like, unfortunately, our, our brains are so conditioned by rules that we want to have this very clear cut framework. So even with something as broad as intuitive eating that gives so much flexibility and so much room for, for, you know, this ebb and flow relationship with food, people still want to, you know, be like, okay, well, but what really are the rules? You know, how many calories do I really have to eat? Um, is it really okay so, if I... So we're not going to diet, but what are you uh huh. Yeah, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, and so it, it is a process in relinquishing some of that rigidity that we have around food. Um, I know that for a lot of folks in early stages of recovery, and I, it certainly was the case for me that early on I thought that okay, so if I'm working on my recovery and I'm doing intuitive eating, that means that I'm not allowed to cope with food, and that means that eating emotionally is a bad thing. And I had gotten that all wrong. You know, I think that was sort of a sign of the time back then when I was getting better, but also it's a message that, that is perpetuated still in our eating disorder treatment culture, that emotional eating is an unhealthy thing. When actually we eat emotionally all the time as humans. I mean, it is a fundamental um, gift that we all have to be able to have a feeling, whether it's, you know, joy or sadness and take care of ourselves with food. Um, you know, it becomes, it, it's sort of a, it becomes a problem when your only coping skill is food, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's so great to point out because the folks that I talk to just carry a lot of shame when it comes to dealing with anything using food. Right. Even though if, if COVID has taught us anything is that like, that's one of the things that is most accessible to people um, mm -hmm. is to sort of work through emotions using food. Um, mm -hmm. I kind of joked with you in, in prepping for this about how there were some conversations on Twitter towards the start of the stay at home orders um, mm -hmm where people were kind of noticing what childhood foods they were gravitating towards now that they were, you know, loading up on groceries for two weeks at a time. You know, that's, that's an example of preparing to eat emotionally, perhaps, and not necessarily in a pathological way. No. Yeah, there was um, plenty of times, especially in the beginning, where I, I don't even know if I texted you about this, Emily, but I was updating um, people in my life about my, my mouth being sore because I was eating so many Sour Patch Kids. And it was, you know, it was getting to the point where I was like, wow, my body was responding to the amount of sour candy that I was taking in. And the truth is that like everybody else in the beginning of um, the stay at home orders and quarantine and just the fear of the virus, my body was stressed, right? And I'm a professional who treats eating disorders and lives and breathes this intuitive eating work and I was just coping you know and I think it's important just to normalize that even outside of the pandemic it doesn't have to be a global pandemic for it to be okay to cope with food but in in any situation that is totally fine and reasonable mm -hmm. yeah and I think this is where we might go back to that distress piece like if you're noticing your food behaviors are causing distress for you then maybe that's something that's worth exploring right but we're certainly not here to be food police and say you know put down the oreos mm -hmm. i mean i think there's been a lot of changes with covid right just in terms of our relationship to food everything from food scarcity to stress at home um I, I'm sure that and Emily, you are just as much for some people. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm sure for you just as much as me that your relationship to food has shifted a bit in the last four months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can actually think of a tangible example where, you know, for background, I'm not a vegetarian, but I generally don't eat a lot of meat. It's not something that I purchase a lot. But that was something that I noticed was changed during the stay at home orders. Um, I'm eating a lot more meat and I think it has a lot to do with just seeking novelty um, through food that I normally would have been getting just 
from hanging out with friends or exploring, you know, new shops or restaurants around DC. Um, you know, instead I'm, I'm looking for that in my kitchen. And so, you know, bringing kind of something into my diet that wasn't normally there was one way for me to just fly around with new recipes and use the grill, you know, other things that were sort of keeping things kind of interesting for me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious, Haley, have you noticed any shifts for you, whether whether it's food or just kind of like general routine? That's been Besides the Sour Patch Kids? <laughs> yeah. They do sell an enormous bag on Amazon. Um, just as a Oh, that wasn't for possible? People. Just buy it in bulk, yeah. Um, but yeah, a couple of things. You know, one is a reflection on how fast my mornings typically move outside of quarantine. You know, it's very typical for me to grab my coffee, grab a pop tart and pretty much like hit, <laughs> start walking. Um, and the, one of the really great things actually about quarantine is having this more mindful, intentional breakfast where I get to actually sit down with my cat and start my day in such, I don't know, just such a better way, you know, not, not to compare the two. There's a function obviously on the pop tart and go, but I've noticed it's had a pretty big impact on my, um, my emotional health, just to have that time for me in the morning. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like, you know, such an interesting thing to take note of and realize, you know, almost like learning something about yourself. I'm like, wow, didn't know how calming, you know, having a slower morning might be for me. Mm -hmm. Sure. And then, you know, there's the, um, <laughs> my own relationship to my anger over the lack of pasta selections at a certain point that would irk me and I'd have to become a little bit more flexible, flexible, you know, with my recipes and whatnot. But yeah, it's like, how could we expect, what was that? For me, it was the peanut butter. It was peanut butter, butter. right. So peanut butter. Um, yeah, how could we not expect our relationship to food to change? And I, I think that for Emily and I, what we see in the in our professional work is that in this time, I'll speak for myself, but as people I work with, as their relationship to food has shifted and their relationship to exercise has shifted during the pandemic, um, their relationship to their body has shifted. Some surprisingly positively, and as expected, you know, there's been a lot of body shame, a lot of body hatred. Um, mm -hmm. with even the shifts in our bodies during this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and this is a good time to acknowledge that body image distress and systemic fat phobia are two very different things. And so, you know, in the time that we have left, Kaylee and I are, are going to be focusing our conversation around cultivating a caring relationship with your body, but we simultaneously want to acknowledge that that is much harder to do when you're uh, experiencing systemic oppression because of your size or shape. Mm -hmm. Or because of your race or your gender, right? So that kind of all belongs. And it's important to note that some of the interventions and techniques um, that we're going to be talking about, some might fit for you and others might not. You know, that these aren't kind of a one-size-fits-all approach, but we've seen by and large that by shifting your thinking, by shifting your environment, um, your relationship to your body can improve. And certainly as you shift your relationship to, to food, your relationship to your body can improve as well. Um, but yeah, so for you, Emily, like, you know, you work directly as providers, Emily and I both work directly with the body. And so you do a fair amount of body image work in your practice just as much as I do. So what, what do you find to be really useful for clients in thinking about wanting to improve their body image? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, what I, what I often say to people is, you know, I, I often hear that phrase, like, you know, I want to feel better in my body. And I think a lot of people think that that's about changing their body. I look at it more about, you know, changing the, the way that you feel it, that you relate to your body. And, and something that's worth exploring is this idea that, you know, we aren't born with poor body image. It's something that is very much learned by comparing ourselves to others and, and finding supposed deficits um, between, you know, what we are, what we have, and what we 
think we ought to have. Um, so something that I want to point out, and you know, this is not to villainize social media, you know, it does a lot of great things for us. Um, but we also have to understand that it accelerates that process of comparison by giving us, you know, hundreds, maybe even thousands of images that we can sort of hold up as standards. And so something that I've uh, just been exploring with clients is this idea of doing not a, not a social media cleanse per se, um, but more of like taking inventory. You know, this might look like, um, you know, picking whatever social media platform you use, whether that's Facebook, Instagram, something else, and maybe looking back at the last dozen or so posts that come up on your newsfeed and taking a moment to look at those a little bit more carefully because often we're just scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Um, but notice, you know, how, how does each one um, sort of prompt a reaction in you? Like, do you notice that the thoughts or feelings or beliefs that accompany that are, are positive, are negative, are neutral? Um, you know, often we're just, we're moving through so quickly that we're not even noticing how things are ran for us. Mm -hmm. um, and something else that I find just kind of an interesting point of exploration is you know, how many of these images or advertisements or posts or whatever center the young, thin, white ideal. And so, you know, depending on what you find in doing an exercise like that, you might consider bringing in some other types of accounts just to, you know, appreciate the full range of body diversity that exists among humans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that you're bringing in that element of consciousness, right? Which is, again, we, we, we want this kind of fixed way. We want the rules. Okay, so what do I do step by step? And so much of this work is a process that takes time. And that first step of just bringing in some consciousness to your social media, right? Like, what are you actually absorbing moment after moment on your tiny screen? Um, and I think just mindfulness in general has been certainly a skill and a practice that I offer to clients in terms of body image. Um, you know, I, I found that yoga to be a very effective practice for me in finding peace in the body that I live in and finding peace with my relationship with the food. Um, and that's something that I also share with clients just helping to build awareness um, of like, what's really going on? Because I think that's another thing when it comes to body image that you might be stuck in this cycle of scapegoating your body, right? You get in a fight with your boss. Oh my gosh, I feel terrible in my body. You know, you, something goes wrong. Oh my gosh, I feel terrible in my body. And we start wondering like, why am I having such a bad body image day? And mm -hmm. instead of following it up with, oh, it's probably because I ate that cupcake or it's probably because I ate too much at lunch, what I help clients to understand is, okay, maybe, but what else has really been going on emotionally that's triggered you to direct shame and hatred directly on the body? Um, so that process, that is, that's a pathway that's been very well exercised, likely in your life. Again, we are taught to do it. And body image work is really about unteaching that process, noticing of like, oh wow, hmm, I just I just made that all about my body and I didn't have to. Um, mm -hmm. And I want to say that work can very can be better supported with a nutritional and therapeutic team. But that's a lot. It's it, it, that that pathway. I'm simplifying it, but that's um that's a lot of the work, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, we're talking about building new neural pathways mm -hmm. and that often, you know, really benefits from having sort of uh, an eye in the sky, so to speak, to kind of catch for more voluminous patterns, um, you know, when we're sort of moving based on maybe thoughts that aren't actually helpful or serving us. Right. Yeah. So well, I think everyone, Haley's um, yeah. asking ourselves, why now is also mm -hmm. a good question when it comes to just having a sucky body image day. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm noticing that there have been some questions popped up. If you've had questions um, so far as we've been chatting, 
feel free to put them in the chat box because we're going to transition to answering some of your questions as best as we can. Uh, just give us a moment to read through these. Yeah, so let me read the, the first one out loud. Um, it says, hi, I'm a school-based clinical psychologist and have been doing teletherapy sessions with students since March. I have seen a huge increase in disordered eating slash eating disorder symptoms since the pandemic began. It, it seems as though maybe people, I work with teens, have more space for rumination, maybe feel a greater need for control, et cetera. I'm wondering if you've seen this and what your thoughts are on it um, from what you know about eating disorder theory and research. Um, I, will, I will just immediately say yes. Hundred percent yes. Yeah. Um, this this really, as I'm reading this, I'm thinking the nervous system. That is what's just going on in my mind, right? That we know that that eating disorders are about the food, and they're not about the food. I believe that eating disorders are really a way that we learn to self-regulate that we learn to regulate our nervous systems. And maybe you have all been hearing about uh, stress and anxiety and all of this very valid response to the virus. Um, so we are in a heightened state within our nervous system. And we've seen uh, on our end too, we have seen an increase in disordered behavior as a way to cope, as a way to manage that stress, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I think some of the things that this person touched on as possible reasons, like all of those are, are valid. Um, and also, you know, when we're, when our, you know, social ties are, are really just happening through social media, like, again, like that room for self-comparison, when we eat crows, and thinking about just all of the sort of online chatter about like quarantine mm -hmm. 15 and you know like here are all the at home workouts you should do and like look at my look at my beautiful plate that I'm Instagramming you know all of that stuff is things that you know especially teenagers are consuming right now and might not be aware of, sort of how it's landing as they just take in message after message like that. Right. Yeah thanks for sharing that. Um, I think it really goes to show that Again, the eating disorders are and disordered eating. They're they're spanning across people of all ages, and even the, the kiddos in school are are struggling too. You know, their their nervous systems are being impacted just as much as ours during this time. Yeah, um, and I, I think something that I would add in just because this person referred to um, sort of like theory and research is the sooner that can be addressed in the therapeutic space, the better because. You know, as so often, you know, almost across the board, we see disordered eating really is that sort of pathway towards malnutrition. Malnutrition makes for more rigid neural pathways. It sort of affects our ability to um, form alternate pathways in the brain, um, which is known as neuroplasticity. And so for maybe young people who are starting to engage in those behaviors, you might start to notice like a little bit more cognitive rigidity, you know, um, just other things that sort of go hand in hand with eating disorder pathophysiology. And so, you know, even if you don't refer out, like, you know, if you can get some supervision from a clinician that specializes in eating disorders, I, I think you'll, you'll be able to do some really good work with those mm -hmm. folks that, that need mm -hmm. interventions rather than later. Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking that for the providers, there, I'm sure there's a mix of, of viewers right now, but um, if there are providers who are listening, who are wanting additional training in eating disorders or wanting a uh, consult, um, I'm available for that. So uh, when we put up our, our um, information at the end, you know, feel free to reach out to Emily and I about upcoming trainings and you know, there's all kinds of stuff going on in the eating disorder community. Um, to help inform our work. So this next question is, any recommended realistic and body positive accounts to share with young adults and teenagers? That's such a great question. I, don't we all wish, I don't know, I don't know if there's teen, teens watching, but I speak for myself, I wish I had access to 
um, body positive accounts on social media when I was growing up. Um, something to sort of counter the, the culture that we are immersed in. Um, Emily, I don't know if you have sort of your favorites off, off the top I, of your head. I pulled up my spreadsheet. Oh, I'm ready. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, yeah, so the, let's see, it's hard to remember what you know, the different um, overlaps that these have, but um, there are a couple that I want to highlight. Um, one, so I'm going to send this out. One is um, Body oh, Posse yeah. Pan. Um, she's really fun and colorful and, um, you know, sort of smashes expectations of, you know, what beautiful bodies might look like. Um, let's see, I'll pull. Got some too. Um, Harrison is um, the, um, she hosts the podcast Food Site, which uh, does a lot of uh, great conversations around health at every size, eating disorder recovery, diet culture, um, et cetera. Um, she might be a good one. Um, I did say Lizzo, um, obviously Lizzo used to speeding. Lizzo beating. Oh, right. Of course. Lizzo beating. Um, I think it's underscore beating. Um, so I used to my appropriate because it definitely highlights a lot yeah. of the sexuality, um, but very fun to watch. Um, were you going to type that one? And uh, yeah, just two other people who I find to be really, really good uh, for all ages, but certainly in particular for a younger crowd, um, Jennifer Rowland and Dr. Colleen Reichman, who are writing a book together that they post every single day on Instagram, uh, Body Positivity. They both are out um, professionally in recovery themselves. And um, I so wish that I had access to a page like that when I was like 16. I mean, they're just they're, they, they're great to follow. Mm -hmm. Thanks for correcting me, Emily. Um, um, I think it's a call to repeat some of the names that you just mentioned. Oh, I have them uh, written here. Oh, did I do it privately? Ooh, shoot, sorry about that. Looks like I'm just, huh. For some reason, it to everyone to publicly, here we go. Yes. Uh, um, Dr. Reichman. And something that I'll add about social media, I've got a list of options. And so, um, and I'm not 100%. Oh, say that, say that again, Emily. Oh, I, I was just going to offer up to our viewers. I have a list of like 100 Instagram handles to follow. And so um, feel free to email me and I'd be happy to share this with you. Also, you'll see our slide at the very end, but myself and Emily are um, active on Instagram as well. So if you're looking for- Newly, newly active. Newly active on Instagram. Yeah, it's been sort of a quarantine project for me. Um, but yeah, you can certainly follow our pages that uh, for more information like that too, for more good content, mm -hmm. if I do say so. Yeah. Uh, so, um, I'm seeing another question. Can you talk about eating late at night, whether it's bad for you or why the body has learned to crave food in order to fall asleep? Um, so this is gonna to touch on a few things, but one thing that I wanna point out is usually the things that we hear with regard to food rules of like, you know, don't eat this for this, these reasons, they tend to have like one foot in the science and one foot not so much. So something, that has been kind of an interesting area of research recently is looking at circadian rhythm. So basically, you know, how, how your internal body clock um, actually affects things like um, weight maintenance and, and that sort of thing. And what we see in some examples of the research is that shift workers, so people who are maybe doing like the graveyard shift, like 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., um, tend to uh, sort of store weight differently than, you know, folks who are maybe matched on um, various factors that have more of that typical kind of like daytime uh, 
work schedule going on. And so I, I have to imagine that that's part of what's driving the whole like don't, don't eat late at night, it'll cause weight gain thing. Um, but I want to, you know, reiterate being a shift worker is a very sort of extreme example of circadian rhythms being disrupted. And it's, it's really hard to then extrapolate from that, that like, you know, sort of regular people shouldn't eat late at night. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there are a lot of other things that overlap with perhaps being a shift worker, like that's probably going to um, interfere with your ability to get enough sleep. You know, if you're taking those kinds of jobs, maybe you have lower socioeconomic sense or live with more chronic stress or, you know, whatever else. And so those are other things that can have an impact on weight status. And so it's really hard to sort of jump to the food and blame that. Um, so it's an interesting question. I would say we're not in a position to totally uh, say one way or the other. But I think something that's worth considering is, you know, if you think about what your typical day looks like and where you're sort of using the most energy, if you have kind of like a nine to five sort of thing, like you're probably most active, whether physically or cognitively, kind of in the morning, afternoon, and it might taper off towards evening. What I found in my practice is that most people do best when their food is somewhat matched to that. You know, they're not waiting all day and then eating a lot at night because you're sort of, you're digging yourself out of this energy deficit all day long. You know, if you can keep eating on a regular basis to kind of match your needs, I, I just noticed that people tend to feel a lot better, you know, feel less fatigue, feel, um, more focus, a little bit more vitality. Um, and so sort of in general speak, uh, that's what I would say about that. As far as craving food in order to fall asleep, one thing that we have to keep in mind is that under eating can fuel sleep disturbances. And so I, I can actually say, Haley and I have a client in common who, um, as she worked to um, normalize her relationship with food, be less restrictive in her food choices, um, she started to notice, like, if she hadn't had, you know, a, a filling dinner and, and probably a night snack, she would wake up in the middle of the night. Um, and I, sometimes that's related to, um, sometimes that's related to hormone cascade. Sometimes that's related to, you know, maybe blood sugar fall a little bit. But it, I mean, if that's what's happening for you and food helps, like, don't be afraid to lean into that. Um, there are certainly other situations in which maybe people are experiencing a psychological need to eat or feel full before they fall asleep. And um, if that is sort of becoming a question mark in your mind, then I would recommend exploring with that with a professional. Mm -hmm. and, Haley, I don't know if there's more that you want to say about it. Oh, no, I think that you covered that very well. Um, I'm looking at this question about speaking to the obsessive calorie intake and except, uh, sorry, obsessive calorie intake and excessive exercise in the Fitzbo community. Um, yes, gosh. Uh, <laughs> uh, we are certainly at odds with the Fitzbo community in a number of ways. Um, again, perpetuating this same thin, white, young ideal who's not running on a lot of calories and isn't running on a lot of nutritional variety either. Um, you know, I know sometimes Emily will recommend, or I don't want to speak for you, but I feel like I remember you recommending the, the recommendations from the World Health Organization, which you might be surprised are the recommendations for exercise from the World Health Organization are pretty far well, below what you're seeing. Oh, national government are, are pretty well below what you might be seeing on on your Instagram. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the suggestions are, um, and again, preference, you know, this might not be feasible for everyone, but just just to give you sort of a comparison, you know, generally we're recommending 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity exercise, which is like a half hour more days than not or 75 minutes of um, vigorous intensity exercise. And for folks who are maybe caught in that, like I'm gonna do an hour hit class, you know, six or seven days a week, that's a lot. It's really a lot. Yeah. 
you're going to need a lot, a lot of calories, right, to support exercise like that. If for some reason you're training professionally, you're an athlete, you know, and that's something I, I'm, I don't follow any fitspos. I don't even know if that's what you call them. I don't follow them on Instagram, but they, they pop up on my feed once in a while. And I'm a, it's yeah. one of those things that's hard to get caught in that trap, right? Eat less, exercise more. I think when I see that combination of, you know, being obsessive about caloric intake and obsessive in exercise, what comes to mind for me is like, wow, that person must not have that sort of unconditional permission to feed themselves. It sounds like right. there's a lot that's being sort of bought and bartered through exercise. Um, and that would be worth exploring in my mind. Yeah. And um, something I'll throw out there, just if you're kind of curious about like Fitspo or what's wrong with that, I am throwing out a very fun BuzzFeed listicle that went through and corrected Fitspo. <laughs> Ooh, did I get rid of the chat? I wanted, uh, I just realized that we're kind of- love it as a uh, Cool. We, we do have two more questions that I want to be sure we get around to. One about, um, one about just the research on intuitive eating. Oh, for some reason I can't see that one. Was that sent just to you? Oh, perhaps. Yeah. So here we go. I'll read it. Um, just wondering about additional research surrounding intuitive eating. It feels like a lot of what you were saying is consistent with this, um, but I'm not sure if I've heard you say that. It seems very rooted in CBT. The account No Food Rules, for example, follows this approach. It's been helpful for my teens. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm not sure about the, uh, the parallel to CBT. I'm not aware, Emily, if there's pieces of that that are incorporated in intuitive eating. I, I'm sure there are, you know, without sort of being technically named. Um, you know, I think the interesting thing about intuitive eating when you compare it to a lot of other sort of like food plans, diet, that kind of thing is it really takes into account more of the um, kind of psychology of eating and human behavior. Um, and so I'm, I'm sure that there are some overlaps with CBT coming from there. Mm -hmm. um, for folks who are maybe interested in learning more and, and learning from the women themselves who, you know, created this framework, um, I... Oh, I was going to send, hmm. I was trying to send their website. Okay, there we go. I'm sending their website, um, which might be worth looking at. And I know that they link to a lot of the research. So especially if I've got any research nerds out there, uh, have fun. <laughs> this last question, we can make time for it. It's a really good one um, about encouraging healthy eating in school aged children which I don't know the last time, Emily, you worked with a school-aged child, but uh, I'm sure you know a thing or two about this. Yeah, I think one of the most concerning things about the direction that nutrition education has taken for um, our kiddos is that it has adopted a very black and white idea of, you know, what, what we ought to be eating. Mm -hmm. So there's something we have to understand about, you know, small children is, nuance does not exist, you know, it's either this or it's that. And so when we put out food, you know, sort of um, food frameworks, like the stoplight system of like, you know, these are the, the go foods, slow foods and woe foods. <laughs> um, you know, what, what a child is likely to internalize is the red foods are bad. If I eat them, I'm bad. Mm -hmm. I want them, I'm, I'm bad. And this is something that's gonna set kids up to just have a really fraught relationship with food. Um, what I wanna encourage, you know, anyone who is maybe a parent with a PTA or, or an educator in, in some form is to really think um, critically about the food messaging that is happening in our schools and sort of, if we can ever sort of swap out the rules for exploration and curiosity, our kids are going to be so much better off. And so, you know, nutrition education might look like, you know, bringing in five different varieties of apples and having kids taste test them and like, you know, work up the courage to try something different or like see if they can notice the difference in flavors or the crunchiness or, or the colors of the apples. Like that's a cool way to get kids interested um, and maybe just work on like introducing 
you know, really nutrient dense foods without making them feel shame around the foods that they really like. Yeah. So um, yeah. There, there is a group of dietitians that is, um, you know, really doing a lot of work to um, put forth a, like age appropriate nutrition education um, that takes into account developmental stages. But, you know, one roadblock that we're hitting with that is a lot of health education is mandated by uh, standards put forth by the CDC. So some of that has to change. Yep. I think uh, a note on uh, our responsibility as grown people is to monitor the language we use around small children, uh, about our own bodies, about our own relationship to food, around what's good, what's bad, who's valuable, who's not. And so um, when I think about children and their healthy relationship to food, I also think about um, raising a generation of, of kids who have a healthy relationship to their body. And so in a lot of ways, that means not only diversifying food, right, but diversifying the, um, the content that they, the, the content, the books, the, the movies, things that they are watching that um, encompass all bodies, right? So that was a piece I wanted to just throw in there about body image. And we've got another really good question that, I mean, it's still rolling. So we might get cut off at some point, but we're, we're happy to answer this last question. Um, yeah, yeah, so. Relating to, um, I think, uh, you know, healthy eating okay. among children, nutrition education among children, this person is writing. Um, I often talk about how parents, when parents control um, how much children have to eat or when, it takes away the child's ability to recognize their own signals and hunger and satisfaction. Mm -hmm. So I would love to defer here to Ellen Satter's division of responsibility model. Yeah. And this has sort of emerged in the last few decades as sort of the, the best way to um, feed children that still allows sort for of the development of autonomy and preservation of hungerfulness signals. And so the way that that works is parents are responsible for um, what they serve their children food-wise and when they serve it. And you know, the hope is um, that parents can provide food on you know, sort of a, a regular ongoing basis. Obviously this isn't a reality for everyone, but that's the hope. Children are responsible for deciding whether and how much to eat. So when we, when parents kind of overstep that role and encourage them, like, you know, like finish your plate or like, you know, you get the, you get the treat if you finish your broccoli, that sort of moves the, the eating drive from something that is sort of internally regulated by the child based on, you know, how, you know, how much room they've got left to something that's very externalized of like, you know, here's the reward or here's the expectation. Um, and so for anybody who's curious, again, that's um, the Division of Responsibility Model uh, by the Ellen Satter Institute. And that's E-L-L-Y-N-S-A-T-T-E-R. Um, mm -hmm. I highly recommend looking that up. Because yeah, certainly, you know, letting your kids be an intuitive eater doesn't mean structure goes out the window. And that's actually a good reminder for, um, you know, adults as well. Like intuitive eating is not there are no guideposts or, or, you know, structure elements that could be useful. It's not, it's not a melee free for all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that you said that because I was thinking the same thing, right? This is a model that we teach children. It's such a simple thing. We actually can apply the same principles to ourselves, right? With intuitive eating. Um, and it's um, if you come from a long history of dieting or disordered eating as an adult, it can be really, really hard to tune into those hunger and fullness cues, right? And they so, might not even be there at first. They might not even be right. there at all. Yeah. Um, so I just want to validate the, the difficult process that it, it really takes to um, move towards embodiment, you know, because. We live in a world where we're pretty much instructed to get out of our body at all times of the day, um, even mm -hmm. around mealtime. So it's a process. Um, 
I'm wondering if there are any other questions. I love that people are coming from different backgrounds and ask questions about kids. Um, yes, question on Facebook. When does emotional eating become problematic? That's such a good question. Um, Your mileage that, will vary. What was that? Your mileage will vary. <laughs> Your mileage will vary. Yes, exactly. Um, you know, there was a time, um, even a couple years ago, when I was working in a treatment center, we would ask clients when they came in every day to program, we would ask about their behavior use. And we would ask the question, have you emotionally ate in the last 24 hours? And I would guess that now two years later, I would advocate to take that off the check-in sheet because um, I feel so much differently about emotional eating as a whole. Now, it becomes problematic. I, well, for, first I should say that emotional eating is a normal, natural part of the human experience, right? Culturally, um, emotionally, the food is connected to these things. And there is absolutely nothing inherently wrong with having an emotional eating experience. Emotional eating can become problematic when it is chronic, ongoing, and serves as somebody's only source of emotional regulation, right? So the, that the coping skills toolbox is sort of limited. Food is the only thing that you're pulling for again and again and again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, seconded. Um, are there any other questions from people who are viewing? Somehow you're getting most of the questions. I can't see them, so. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 um, I was stuck on a mode where I was like privately sending somebody Lizzo beating. So I apologize <laughs> about that. I didn't realize I was on private mode. Um, Emily, this was awesome. I mean, as always, such a pleasure just to chat with you. And yeah, I really anyway. hope that um, for people who joined us today that you walk away with some new information. And please don't hesitate. If you have follow-up questions, um, shoot an email, you know, check us out on Instagram. We are yeah. so happy to uh, talk about this stuff. It's like our favorite topic, so. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, Haley can attest that like when we get together for happy hour or or did in normal times, uh, <laughs> it was to stay on on personal topic we would end up you know chatting about work quite often. So this is something that she and I both care a tremendous amount about. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, thank you. And we're getting all the thank yous. I don't know if you see that, Emily. A lot of people are saying thank you. This was informative. Thank you. Uh, no, thank, thank you, to you. everyone. Who yeah. Um. All right. Well. Maybe we can do this again sometime. It was wonderful to see you all and to connect. And I hope everybody has a wonderful Friday and a wonderful rest of your weekend. Mm -hmm.